Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, today, I will just say that I am not officially representing the New York Botanical Garden, but I will be using their ladies border as a model of how you can expand your hardiness zone. Before we proceed, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page as to the definition of hardiness. So that is a plant's ability to survive cold winter temperatures. Here is a picture of the 250 acre uh, garden. We're only able to talk today by this small area by the red arrow, the ladies border. It's only 300 feet by 30 feet. Everyone always wants to know why is it called the ladies border? The garden was established in 1891 and in the early 1900s, there was a ladies auxiliary group. So you can imagine that they were giving tea parties and serving lemonade and otherwise helping with membership. But by the late 1920s, the group had evolved into the ladies advisory council and they advised the board to plant a garden that would show the artistic aspect of flower culture. The reason that they had to specify this is that many botanic gardens at the time, including NYBG, tended to group their plants scientifically. Uh, for instance, they would group them um, by plant family or by agricultural use. So the ladies uh, got their wish and uh, Ellen Biddle Shipman, who was a very uh, rare uh, find at the time, a female landscape architect, created a lady's border, uh, said to be quite beautiful. It was bulbs, it was perennials, it was flowering shrubs. But as we all know, gardens peter out. And in 2001, Lyndon B. Miller was asked to completely redo the ladies' border. Now, Lyndon B. Miller had just recently completed the New York Botanical Gardens perennial gardens, which were immediately adjacent to the ladies' border. And of course, she didn't want to repeat the same old, same old ideas. So she came up with this concept. Let's use the ladies' border as a place to experiment with tender plants, so-called semi-hardy plants. In other words, plants that are not normally expected to survive New York City winters. Catherine? Yes? Is there any way to have you closer to your mic? We're getting some observations about an echo that we're getting oh, in your voice. Yes, let me... Uh, let me try something. Aha, there I'm you are. Much there better. All right. Uh, I'm at the smaller screen, but it's just fine. All right. So here is the USDA uh, plant hardiness zone map. Currently, uh, the country is divided into 26 zones, one through 13, each with an A and a B. Uh, it's important to remember how these zones are determined. Uh, you can pick any point on the map, uh, stay there for 30 winters, record the coldest temperature each winter, take the 30 numbers, divide by 30, and that is the number that's going to get you on the hardiness chart. And so when you think about it, that's really a rather limited amount of data. Uh, it, could be very interesting to know, was there one day of cold or, you know, was there, you know, were there 30 days of cold, but that is not incorporated in the number. Uh, nonetheless, it, it does a fairly good job of telling you whether a plant will make it through the winter. Um, and as you can see, the zones range from a temperature of negative 60 in the winter to a temperature of positive 70 in the winter. 
Uh, my favorite place to determine a hardiness zone is morningchores.com. And anytime you see a little smiley face on one of my slides, it means that I will be including this reference in the program notes that will be sent to you along with a recording of this Zoom. You simply uh, put your zip code in. Here I've put in uh, the zip code of the Bronx and up, up pops your hardiness zone. So today we'll be talking a lot about zone 7A, which you can expect that the coldest temperature that you will have in the winter will be zero to five degrees Fahrenheit. So how can we expand our plant hardiness zones, which I think in my mind is like trying to grow pineapples in the snow. The first step is going to be finding a sheltered microclimate. There will be places in your yard that will be warmer, more sheltered than other places. Here is the ladies border. It faces south, southeast. It is protected from wind by these native junipers, also by the conservatory. And the conservatory also radiates heat into the garden. In addition, the garden is well-drained. Pre-winter um, steps can be important. In other words, don't fertilize, don't prune at such a time where you are spurring tender growth that is not gonna be able to make it through the winter. Winter protection is a thought, burlap, other blankets, uh, evergreen boughs to protect your garden. Number three are different ways that you can bring your plants in for the winter, either movable containers or bring in stem cuttings or lift your bulbs. But it's really um, four, five, and six that are the uh, crux of the matter, looking for hardier species in the same genus looking for hardier hybrids or hardier cultivars. The fun of it, of course, can be challenging the conventional wisdom that blank doesn't grow here. Uh, and you can move. Uh, some people buy their house because of the school system, uh, but you can also um, choose your real estate by the hardiness zone map. You see here in Pennsylvania, there are six different zones, ranging from minus 20 in the winter to, to check here, uh, to 10 degrees in the winter. So let's go to the ladies' border. And uh, afterwards, I think we should go to the Hudson Garden Grill for lunch. Um, I am going to, again, attach to the Zoom a complete list of all 240 plants that are in the ladies' border. Um, we will talk about 12 of them today. We're peeking into the ladies' border. We see that the entrance is flanked by two crepe myrtles. Um, if you do look at these slides later on your own, if the Roman numeral of the plant is black, the plant is deciduous in New York City. If the Roman numeral is green, it's evergreen in New York City. But back to our crepe myrtles, Ligerstremia indica. Uh, these were brought to the United States in the late 1700s, uh, brought to Charleston, South Carolina. They were then taken to Mount Vernon, um, but they were always known as a southern tree, uh, zone eight. So thinking back on how we can uh, have crepe myrtles in a different zone instead of uh, indica, we could switch it out for the Japanese crepe myrtle, farii. This, this takes a zone six to a 10A. 
So it's cold hardy, it's mildew resistant. It has very interesting bark. For some reason, it's hard to find. We do not even grow it at the New York Botanical Garden. I do not see it at Morris Arboretum in Philadelphia. Uh, so I'm not sure why it's hard to find. Um, they're very happy with the one they have at the Swarthmore Arboretum, possibly because it only comes in white, possibly because the flower clusters are said to be a little smaller. But how about if we make a hybrid between these two? And this is exactly what the National Arboretum has done hybridized indica and farii. In the 1950s, uh, there was a tremendous mildew problem with the crepe, myrtle, crepe myrtles down south and the National Arboretum to solve that problem, uh, hybridized indica with farii because of its mildew resistance. They developed at least 25 cultivars. All of them were given Native American names and um, they were produced primarily to, find, to fight the mildew, but look, because Farii is cold tolerant, the zone now is a six or a seven. So I've color coded these for you. Muscogee is the lavender here. Choctaw is the pink. Natchez is the white. My favorite color in this series is Tuskegee, this gorgeous rose color. Um, as I mentioned, Farii has um, interesting bark, and so the hybrids um, also inherited this trait, and you can really enhance your winter gardens, your winter season of interest by carefully selecting your crepe myrtles for their bark. Here's Muscogee and Choctaw, very different. Now, a gentleman named Dr. Carl Whitcomb, you see his name in this cultivar here, um, took a very uh, different tact in um, improving crepe myrtles. Instead of hybridizing indica, he made cultivars of it. How did he do this? He took 65,000 seeds and treated them. I don't know how he treated them, but the general way that you would treat seeds is you would expose them to irradiation or enzymes or chemicals to try and induce mutations. After studying these 65,000 seedlings, uh, Dr. Whitcomb came up with 10 cultivars with one through 10 which he um, thought were good enough to uh, put for sale. And so here you see Wit 2 in the ladies' border. Uh, he chose this particular one because it is red. Um, red is not a part of the color spectrum of um, indica in the wild because it is mildew resistant and also because it, it tolerates a zone six to seven. And um, finally, in the ladies' border, we also have the dwarf crepe myrtles. Um, I particularly love the way in the spring they have new red growth. And the magic uh, of any dwarf is that you can grow it in a container more easily and that you can cover it uh, more easily during a winter cold spell. So here you get to see cherry dazzle uh, blooming in the uh, ladies' border. So you see that we used uh, almost every one of our tricks uh, to expand the plant hardiness of uh, crepe myrtles. Number two, in the late 
70s, there was a tragedy at the U.S. National Arboretum with the camellia collection, absolutely decimated by unusually cold winters. And we're not talking about young plants. These were 30 to 40 year old camellias, um, all dead. Um, just for a few minutes, I hope we can hold these, uh, I don't know what to say, uh, species in our minds. So let's just remember that uh, C. japonica died, C. sasanqua died but C. oleifera survived. So if you are at the National Arboretum and you're trying to think, what could we do better uh, so that our camellias will not die? Sure, you could, you could look for a better microclimate or you could try to protect them a little better, or put them in movable containers, but Really, the heart of the matter is going to be finding hardier species, hardier hybrids, and hardier cultivars. So what is this? This is about 50 years later. Let's look at the hardy camellias that are found in the ladies' border. Um, one of the winter bloomers, of course, is going to be C. oleifera. It's actually this cultivar here, Lushan Snow, is the re is the very plant, you know, it is clones, cuttings from the very plant that survived that winter at the National Arboretum. If you have a wonderful hardy plant, of course, you're going to use that to make hybrids. And so that was used to make this series of uh, white, white flowered uh, hybrids in the ladies border. And uh, there are many more hybrids available. As far as um, C. japonica, which you remember did not survive, there are now um, many cultivars that will survive. I don't know how they were all created, but Korean fire is the result of an expedition uh, all the way to Korea. Uh, they went to uh, a place in Korea which was particularly cold, and yet where C. japonica grew. They brought home those seeds and grew them. And that is how we have this red-flowered Korean fire uh, cultivar available. And finally, our fall-blooming uh, Sasanqua has an interesting story of this cultivar, Long Island Pink. It was simply a camellia that was seen growing and cold hardy on Long Island. And so it was turned into a cultivar and it's actually hardy all the way to a zone 5B. So some beautiful pictures. Here's Oleifera, Lushan Snow. Here's Lushan Snow hybridized with Sasanqua and creating Survivor. I love the pink blush on Survivor. And also notice that insects are attracted even though this is blooming in the, in the winter. Japonica Springs Promise uh, is um, definitely noteworthy and brings up something we haven't talked about in that it has unusually cold tolerant flower buds and flowers. So when you think about it, just because a camellia can make it through the winter uh, doesn't mean that you're going to be enjoying flowers if the flower buds and the flowers are not particularly cold tolerant. So something to look for um, as you choose a cultivar. And here's uh, Turandot just to show how floriferous these camellias can be uh, in the winter. All right, number three, Prunus mume, Peggy Clark. The straight species, Prunus mume, has white flowers and a single layer of petals. 
But Peggy Clark is special because it has these pink flowers and a double layer of petals. Uh, people love them in the ladies' border or love this one tree in the ladies' border because it blooms at such an unusual time, January through March. People loved um, the Mume so much that the garden now has eight additional cultivars planted directly across from the ladies' border. The white one that you see here is Rosemary Clark, and the pink one is Bonita. You notice that there was a Peggy Clark and a Rosemary Clark. Yes, it was a plant breeder, W.B. Clark, who um, created these cultivars. The Prunus Mume at NYBG do fruit. Uh, most people think that the fruit is bitter. However, it is pickled in the uh, Japanese culture to make ume, umeboshi, so a condiment. And just a reminder that I guess any fruit tree can be messy uh, when you plant it along the sidewalk. Number four, Magnolia grandiflora, Edith Bogue, the Southern Magnolia. Of course, up north, uh, you can grow Asian magnolias and Magnolia virginiana, but uh, Edith Bogue uh, was a woman. She went to Florida, bought herself a Southern Magnolia, took it back up to Montclair, New Jersey, where it grew beautifully. And so it was developed into a cultivar and uh, named for her. On the right, uh, I'm showing the fruits. And I made you a little chart. We're not going over it, uh, but you'll have it of the three most cold hardy Southern Magnolias. So Edith Bogue would win for the size of the flowers, 12 inch lemon scented flowers. Bracken's Brown Beauty would win for cold hardiness 5B. And Little Gem would win for being the smallest and therefore the most easily covered or protected in the winter. Here's a picture of Bracken's Brown Beauty uh, at the Morris Arboretum. Brown because the buds are covered with brown fuzz, the leaves are covered on their undersides with brown. And here's little gem growing in my neighbor's backyard in Florida because it does well all the way uh, to zone 10. But you notice it is a smaller tree with much smaller flowers. Here's number five, Rhododendron austrinum. And when you hear Australium, like Australia, it means Southern. Uh, Florida flame azalea, yes, it is uh, native to Florida. Uh, so you might think that it wouldn't be growing um, in New York City, but it does very well. And uh, here we see it in all its uh, flame colored glory. Number six, Edgeworthia, Chrysantha, the paper bush. It's called the paper bush because even today, the bark of this plant is used to make uh, the paper for Japanese currency. And the story here is that Lyndon B. Miller uh, got a potted plant of Edgeworthia when she was in California and brought it home on a plane to plant in the ladies' border. People told her it would not survive. And here is that same plant today uh, doing beautifully. This is how it looks in the summer with green leaves, but it's even prettier in the fall after it loses its leaves and you can enjoy the uh, bark with its lenticels and its uh, leaf scars. And also the flower buds 
dangle and they're covered with silvery hairs which insulate them against the cold and of course they look particularly beautiful with the backdrop of this holly we knew that it was going to bloom in yellow because um, its name is chrysantha but it blooms you know at an unusual time in march and fills the air with the smell of spicy gardenias. Here is Fatsia japonica variegata, said to enjoy a 7B um, in general, variegated plants will not be as hardy as the straight green species. This makes sense because as you can imagine, the white areas of the leaves are not able to participate in photosynthesis uh, to make food for the plant. So the plant is somewhat deprived in that way. Uh, but uh, Fatsia japonica variegated uh, breaks this rule. It is said to be more cold hardy than even the straight green, straight green version. Perhaps the genes sorted in that way. Uh, it was hard to see the variegation, so I'm pointing it out for you here. And it does bloom in late November and fruits um, at NYBG in December. Yes, you can have palms in New York City. Uh, right now we're growing the dwarf palmetto in the ladies border. You see on the right that it's so happy that it, it's put out a flowering stalk. Here in the fall, uh, the flowers have turned to fruit. But I did recently give a talk in South Carolina about um, hardy palms. So I happen to know that the hardiest palm species in the world is said to be this needle palm or porcupine pine palm goes all the way down to zone 6B. To my eye, looks a lot alike the sable miner that we just saw. Uh, it's about the same size, three feet by three feet. Um, this particular palm is great uh, in shade or sun. But some of you may not really think that uh, a palm is a palm unless it has a trunk like a coconut palm. And so for you, uh, the, the most cold hardy palm with a trunk is going to be Trachycarpus. Um, here's Fortunii. Zone seven, Wagnerianus is a dwarf form. Again, you could cover it more easily. That's a seven. And there's actually a tra trachycarpus all the way from Bulgaria uh, that is said to survive 6B. Now, the ladies' border did try a trachycarpus of some sort. I suspect it was Bulgaria in 2007 and it did not survive, uh, which just goes to show that these, these are somewhat experiments. How about bananas? Here's, now you can't have the Cavendish banana, but you could have Musa Basju, the hardy banana. It does have fruits on it that look like bananas. However, they're very fibrous and inedible. But this plant is grown widely in Japan because it yields fibers. You can see how attractive it is with the red midribs. Here it is, the same clump in the garden in the fall. Now, the leaves have been torn along their parallel veins. Uh, this is a natural uh, happening. And prevents the plant from toppling over um, as the wind goes through an undivided leaf. 
we do not get flowers and we do not get fruits at NY Beachy. Yucca, Yucca Gloriosa Variegata, uh, which you see here. Again, we have a variegated form, but it's doing just fine. Blooms annually. And here you see the yucca in the garden really functioning um, because of its size as a shrub. And there are also uh, two yucca rostrata, big bend yuccas that you might not expect to see in New York City. Big bend is in Texas. These yuccas are also native to Mexico, but they do very well in um, the ladies' border. I have never seen them bloom in the ladies' border, but I was lucky enough to catch this one blooming in Chanticleer right outside of Philadelphia. That's a zone 6B. And the tour guide there said uh, that this yucca blooms every 13 years or so. Jasmine, yeah, jasminum, polyanthum, Chinese jasmine. Uh, many of us like to grow this indoors as a house plant. Uh, beautiful white fragrant flowers, but it's a zone eight. So we'll use our trick and we will plant a different species. Uh, winter jasmine, it's this yellow plant in the corner with by the red arrow blooming in March. You see it is called nudiflorum because it blooms on leafless branches. Unfortunately, I have to admit it does not have a sweet smell uh, or any smell. And here it is in the summer and it has these uh, wonderful leaves each with three leaflets. And finally, here's Alstroemeria, the Peruvian lily. I took this picture in my grocery store. I mean, the very common cut flowers uh, sent up to us from South America, zone eight. But fortunately, there is a hardy hybrid, which is a zone 6B, Casablanca growing in the ladies' border. And there is an an additional Alstroemeria called Third Harmonic, uh, which also grows in the ladies' border. I'm showing it to you here on planttracker.nybg.org uh, to recommend this site to you because one of the wonderful features is when you look up any plant, you're bound to find a phenology chart, and that will tell you when you can expect the plant to be flowering or fruiting um, and can help you make your own garden decisions. I do recommend Lyndon B. Miller's book about all of the various gardens she has uh, planted in public spaces. It's very easy to read, very down to earth. Um, lots of photographs, and most importantly, in the back of the book is a several-page list of her favorite cultivars. Um, so that's worth having in and of itself. I've added one more thing to this uh, expanding your hardiness zone list, and that is you could wait. Here are the 2,040 projected hardiness zones. If you check out these colors, um, you will see that almost every area in the country will go up about one hardiness zone by 2040. So, I thank you all. I thank the Hardy Plant Society for having me. I thank you for attending. And I look forward to 
some discussion and I'd love to hear about tender plants that you are growing in your area. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much, Catherine. And um, welcome. If you would like to uh, join us visually, that'd be okay. super. Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, I have some. I, all right. I'm going to stop my share. I am going to start my video. Okay. All right. Go. So one of our, our uh, audience members has an interesting question. You cited that marvelous um, site that is going to be on your list. Uh, I think it was, I forget what it was called. Morning, morning chores. Oh, yes. Right where you can identify, uh, just put in your zip code. And yeah. uh, the questioner, Tom Morazic, <laughs> is asking, have you noticed sometimes that there's a difference from your cited source of looking up a hardiness zone and then looking at the official USDA plant hardiness zone map? Have you ever observed Oh, that? no, I have not. Um, I just say one more thing and then I want to know if he has. <laughs> because the reason that I like that site, I there obviously you can do this on other sites, but sometimes your zone comes up as a pinpoint on the map. And I can hardly tell what color. Is it this green? Is it that green? I just love the way this one pops up, you know, with the 7A right in my face. Um and with an explanation of the temperatures associated with 7A. But now, yes, please, Tom, do you find um, a difference? If you want to unmute, Tom? Hello? He's there somewhere. I see him. Yeah. Hello, Tom. Tom? Hmm. You've unmuted, but you're not, if you're speaking, we're not hearing you. So uh, it may be your sound system on the computer. Well, maybe Tom could type in the chat box as answer then. Oh, that's a good idea. So Tom, while you're typing, I'm going to go on to Kathy Moss's question. Uh, it's more of an observation. Um, she said that she has used heavyweight Agribon row covers over her potted salvias. It has allowed zone seven and sometimes zone eight plants to survive outside. She lives in zone six, by the way. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so she said she would like to pr protect my front in-ground salvias. Is there something similar to Agabon that is not bright white that would blend into the brown winter landscape? Do you know of any such thing? No, but I... Hope that somebody who does might put that in the chat. Yeah. Or, you know, you could make a decorative statement of, of the, the white in the front garden. <laughs> I don't know. Gardeners do some pretty strange stuff, but the neighbors love your garden. So whatever. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions at this point. It's really interesting to, to hear your presentation. Ah, Tom's... He said he's not compared the two searched of Hardy Nissons, but he's always gone to the USDA source in the past. So it would be interesting. Yeah. Well, even, even with our severe cold snap, I would think that everyone in our audience would agree that we've had an, ex to date, we've had an extremely mild winter this year. Yeah. But, you know, February is often full of surprises. <laughs> Um, Catherine, uh, thank you so very much for a really interesting program. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. Um, I don't, it's up, it's up to you. I could, you know, show five minutes of beautiful flowers from the um, ladies border that we didn't have a chance to talk about. Um, um, before so. I do. Nancy Matlack says that you can use frost shield protection blanket. They sell it in 10 by 12 foot uh, sheets and it's green. This is for Kathy Moss and for anybody else who's looking to protect something in the garden. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, got a got a got a big thank you. Uh, there is here another question. What crepe myrtles would you suggest for zone six? Oh, for zone six, um, the first of all, farii, um, you know, is the the is going to make it right? The Japanese crepe myrtle. And there are cultivars of farii. I think one is called townhouse with particularly beautiful bark. So that's what I would recommend. And then I also hear that of, of you know, I, I know that that we said six slash seven, but the one that tends to go towards six is going to be that white Natchez made, um, created by the U.S. National Arboretum. So I would say either a white Japanese crepe myrtle or um, the hybrid Natchez from the National Arboretum. Okay. All right. So I am going to ask uh, my audience, it, you can go to the reaction section of, at of your uh, Zoom. If you're interested in staying for maybe 10 minutes of images of plants in the ladies border, um, in which case we can impose on our speaker to give us the extra 10 minutes. Um, oh, I'm getting lots of thum thumbs up. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, uh, yes. So uh, if you will uh, find your program and share it. That'd be great. Oh, yes. Lots of positive. All right. Great. Because I, yeah, I was sorry that only to show, you know, 12. Let's see how we do here with the sharing. While you're doing that, if you choose not to stay, that's fine. You'll be getting the, the, uh, the recording uh, after the program. But this is a, a lovely look at the ladies' border. If you haven't been, I would suggest a New York moment in your life. And Catherine, take it away. All right. It'll be with, without my talking. How's that? This is one of my favorites, so I'm dwelling on it.
All right, I guess that's it. Thank you so much. If there was something you saw there and you couldn't write fast enough, folks, remember that you will be getting the recording so you can uh, pause it to make notes and add to your shopping list since we uh, are rapidly approaching gardening season. Thank you very, very much, Catherine, for a wonderful program and uh, see everybody in the gardens. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.